Hi, you're watching New York State Legislative Report with Senator Patrick Gallivan. I'm Julia Logandy. Today, the Senator and I are going to talk about what's going on in the New York State Senate. It's great to be with you again, Senator. Well, I'm glad to be back. Uh, you know, the, the Senate has had a really productive session. You know, went right out of the gate with some job creation, taxpayer protection legislation. It's already passed the property tax cap. Um, on time and responsible budget that included Recharge New York, which is also really important in the creation of jobs. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to know, there's only about a month left in session. What are your priorities? We have to now enact these things in the law. Of course, we've passed these things in the Senate. Um, people have cried out time and time again, and their focus has been taxes, spending, jobs. Spending out of control. We've nipped that in the bud by getting it under control in the state budget. Taxes out of control. Property tax cap um, can begin to address that. And then we want to work to create an environment conducive to the creation of private sector jobs to, to stir our economy. The budget contained, as you mentioned, a number of things towards that end. Uh, and so we've got that through. But with the property tax cap, which I, I think needs to be our biggest priority, while we passed it in the Senate, while the governor supports it, we need to work with the Assembly to actually enact this into law. Once that happens, we have to pay attention to man the whole area of mandate relief. Um, there's no way that we can, uh, communities, municipalities, school boards can sustain a property tax cap without meaningful mandate relief. It would just undo so many of the things that are in place right now. It would cripple governments, and, but, but we do need to work for those things. Um, people just can't afford to pay any more money to government. Government can't continue to just keep spending. Right. Um, there is a petition that people can go online and sign and sign up um, if they are for the property tax cap. About 18,000 people have already um, added their name to this, and it's uh, past the propertytaxcap.com. Pretty significant. Yeah. I mean, the people are speaking up. They continue. Uh, for the past year, they've been they've they've wanted change. They're screaming and yelling. We can't pay anymore. We can't afford anymore. We need change, and that's evidence the evidence of it that they continue to stand up and and try to get their elected officials to do something about it. Right, so it was the governor's bill, and the Senate passed it. So it's the assembly that's holding it up. Well, a lot of people want to point fingers. I, I think that we have a process up here that I've learned in my first year. Um, of course, we have two houses of the legislature. Each has their own timetable. I think what's more important and what gets done by the end of the legislative session, not who does it first. But I do want to point out the Senate made this a priority took it seriously, and it was among the first bills that we've passed. And now, of course, it's up to our counterparts in the Assembly to do the same. Right. I know there's a lot of people asking about, you know, what would a property tax cap do? And there's an example in Massachusetts. I guess they uh, passed the property tax cap in 1980. And um, at that time, their property taxes was the third highest in the country. And now, with the property tax cap still there, Massachusetts ranks 33rd in property taxes. So we can see some relief there because we are the Absolutely. Highest. We're so close. And we see other states that have some sort of property tax cap legislation, different ways, shapes, and forms. We are behind all of them. And so we need to do something about taxes. Right, so you talked about the mandates. There are a lot of outlandish mandates that aren't really necessary. Can you talk about that? Well, there's, there's countless mm -hmm. mandates, but we look at some crazy things. School districts. We saw in recent times, several years back, uh, some real abuses um, school, uh, of a school district in Long Island with their, some of their administrators. Mm -hmm. As a result, I think the states overreacted. We certainly need to have audits, but do schools need to be audited six times? Do schools need to deal with pesticide notifications? Do schools need to provide an, a seat for every single person on a school bus when you might have five to ten percent of the students are driven in by their parents. Another five percent of students are driving and you watch school buses go out half empty all the time. It's a waste of money, a waste of waste of gas, waste of fuel, waste of all these different things. Those are just a couple examples, but you could go on and on with them. Um, we need to look at how we can relieve some of that burden on the local school districts and upon municipalities. People talk about unfunded mandates. I fall into the trap sometimes. But keep in mind, we are still sending nearly $20 billion to local school districts and aid to communities. Uh, so not every mandate is unfunded. That $20 billion 
is helping to pay for some of these mandates. Uh, rather than pointing fingers, we need to work together with school boards, work together with local government officials to ease the burden for taxpayers. Yeah, so property tax um, relief and mandate relief, those are generally um, items that are big picture items. Um, are there any more specific initiatives that you are pursuing to rein in the cost of state government? We're trying to do things uh, to make government more efficient, um, tr trying to work with governments to let them do their job better, do it in a more cost-effective manner. One of the bills that we're sponsoring has to do with letting municipalities and governments collaborate um, on purchasing contracts so that they could, they could use you know, the, the power of getting together large quantities, lower costs, instead of all ha them having to bid out contracts individually. That's just one thing. And that, came, that comes from listening to local officials. Local highway superintendents came up, uh, brought the idea forward. We've talked with NISAC about it, talked with local government officials. They think it's something that can help them, so we want to try to move it forward. Um, we do have to look at school districts, and y you talk about um, spending between Medicaid and education. Those are our two biggest cost centers. We're spending nearly $17,000 a year per student. You can send most students to private schools for less than that, and the private schools are getting better results than many of our public schools. Yeah. So we need to look at those costs, try to rein them, them, them in, and and look at other things as well, not just costs of school districts, but local governments. We are providing services. We're cutting services. We're streamlining, streamlining at the state level. Local governments, I think, need to do the same. Many have done a good job of it. Um, people say, well, we can't keep providing the same services. Maybe we can't. My question is, do we need to be providing all the services that government provides right now? Do we need to be in people's lives, in businesses' lives, to the extent that we are? I think not. Yeah, I think across the board, you just have to really look at everything and see if it's making a lot of sense. Of course. We're spending at the state level, just state government alone, over $130 billion. While we cut the budget this year, you can't tell me that we can't find much more significant savings out of $130 billion. Absolutely. Um, talk about your idea. Um, you know, everyone votes um, for a school budget two times a year, um, and that usually raises local taxes. Um, tell us what your idea is in case a budget isn't passed. Right now, the way the law is, if a budget's not passed and ultimately a contingent budget is adopted, uh, it, it really doesn't provide that much savings to taxpayers. So the fact that a school board puts a budget forward and it's defeated, it's, it's not really that significant. Um, I, I think there should be. It should be significant. School boards should be accountable to the citizens of that particular district, the taxpayers of that particular district. They need to be thoughtful when they're putting school budgets forward. And what I, the legislation that we're proposing is that if a school budget ultimately gets voted down, that the tax levy stays the same as the prior year spending. And I think that would encourage school districts to look a little closer uh, at their spending, be a little bit more responsive and responsible to taxpayers. And I'm not pointing a finger at all school districts across the state. This is just in general terms, trying to get state spending under control. Many school boards are responsible. Many school districts are responsible. But when you've got uh, what some would view as an excess number of administrators, when, when you have teachers being laid off, programs being cut, but no cut in spending for administrators, I think that's problematic. Mm -hmm. And we need to focus on what are we doing with education, what's its purpose, and provide funding for that. At the same time we're looking at the funding, we need to look at education. We're still teaching kids uh, some things that we taught them in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, and it's mandated. Is that preparing them for a 21st century world? Mm -hmm. um, do we need to... Phys ed, for example, when I went to college, I was a physical education major. Um, turns out that's not the career that I pursued, but phys ed is, in some cases, is basketball and football and dodgeball and volleyball and all these different things. Doesn't it make more sense to teach kids nutrition, proper health, so that they can have a, a lifetime of good health, mm -hmm. lifetime type skills. I don't know if it's appropriate for them to be playing games. But that's just one example of something to look at. I'm not saying get rid of it. 
or not. I'm just simply saying there should be no sacred cows. We should be looking at how we prepare people to be, be a productive citizens, responsible citizens, prepare them to support family, support themselves, and be a responsible member of the community. Uh, as you mentioned before, there's really no secret that New York's Medicaid system is one of the most expensive in the nation. And you are the chairman of the Senate Social Services Committee. Yes. Um, how are you looking to make the state's health care system less expensive for local governments, but at the same time continuing to make sure our New Yorkers are getting the coverage that they need? That, I think, is, is uh, you, hit, you hit the nail on the head. Certainly, there are people that need help. And part of government's responsibility is to provide services and help for those that truly need it. And I think that's the concept of social services and Medicaid. But we need to do it in a responsible manner. Um, people close to the services right now, many of these services are administered at the county level. We've proposed um, essentially county opt-in or opt-out legislation so that we let the counties make the decision which options that are not federally mandated which options they want to provide for their, their citizens. I think the people closest to it know best. And we could help to streamline services that way. Um, we, just, we need to continue to look at it. We've cut the spending for this year. We've capped the spending for next year. We, we have had uh, the governor appointed a commission to come up with recommendations. We don't know how that's all going to pan out. There were some good recommendations, some the door is still open on. But we need to keep looking at it, and this commission should not, have just, should not just be a one-time thing. We need to look at it and look at every single dollar spent to see if we can't do it better. Right. Um, you've shown your support for Native Americans in western New York and really across New York State. Um, and you're helping now to advance a mechanism that would educate legislators um, on how uh, issues that affect Indian nations. So tell us about the new committee that would help government leaders um, come to a better understanding of all types of Indian nations and how everyone can work together. Well, d Senator Skelos, the majority leader, deserves a lot of credit, as does um, Senator Maziers, who is now the chair of the newly formed Committee on Native American, Amer Native American Affairs. We have a number of Indian nations across the state, um, out in my district, out in western New York. Uh, a portion of my district covers some of the Seneca Nation territory. But they are a sovereign government. But we, we live side by side. We're part of the same community. People work together, live together, and, and I think need to have meaningful dialogue and communication between our governments. There's many problems. You look at the cigarette tax issue as one, in and out of the courts. It's lingered for years and years and years. I think it's time that we sit together um, as governments, talk about it, try to come up with meaningful solutions on things that we can agree on, and things that we disagree on, we need to work through them. The answer isn't violence, the answer is not fighting, and the answer certainly, as we have seen, because this has dragged on for years and years and years, is not, is not to go to court every single time with every single disagreement that we have. Right. And they're bringing a lot of money into Western New York. Let's end the show today now with, uh, you were speaking out at a news conference, and you said why it is so important to um, evolve government. It is. Um, we, we look at the way that we've done things for years. And we can't keep doing it that way. You hear that time and time again. But we have spiraled out of control. We have seen uh, the last census numbers, while we have grown as a state, we lagged far behind growth in other states. And I think it, it certainly has to do with the way government has spent money uh, just outlandishly how government has gotten out of control, how it's over-regulated, we've now seen the results. And I think um, with what we've seen in recent years, with the out-migration that we've seen, that our leaders, elected officials, recognize that. We've had quite a big turnover in the Senate. We've, we have a new governor, and people know we have to do business different, and hopefully we've got a good start and we'll keep going in the right direction. It is about time. Thank you so much for okay. being with us, Senator. My pleasure. For any additional information, you could log on to galavan.nysenate.gov. What we've seen over the years, we've seen problems with government, and it's, it's not often that we, we talk about the successes of government. We see a new era in Albany where we've got members of the legislature working together, working with the governor, doing our jobs, getting a budget done on time. 
uh, dealing with some of the, the very tough issues facing New York State. Among the issues over the years facing New York State is its relationship with the Native American, uh, the governments throughout the state. And I, I simply would say that with the establishment of this committee, the leadership of Senator Skelos, Senator Maziers, that it's about time. Um, our obligation as, as leaders, as government officials, whether it's uh, the, the different nations or whether it's New York State government, is to advance the interests of our constituencies, our communities, our economy, and work together with other governments, work together with areas of mutual concern, and as you've heard others say, where there's differences, work through those differences towards the betterment of the communities that we live in.